to the fifth edition of the Transform webinar series. This time was a very special guest, uh, Manon Aubry, the recently elected co-president of the left group in the European Parliament. My name is uh, Walter Bayer. I'm a Vienna-based economist and I'm political coordinator of the network Transform Europe. Together with my friend and colleague, Danai Kolzida, who is director of the Nikos Polanzas Institute from Greece, I will be moderating uh, the event this afternoon. Transform Europe is a network of 34 organizations and journals from 22 European countries. We are active in the field of critical research and political education. Simultaneously, we are a think tank in cooperation with the part of the European left. Manon Aubry was elected on behalf of France Insoumise to the European uh, Parliament. She holds, uh, along with Martin Schirevan, the co-presidency of the GUE NGL group since the last elections in 2019. She has a degree in international affairs and human rights from the faculty of Sciences Po in Paris. After her studies, she joined the humanitarian sector at the Doctors of the World in Liberia. She lived nearly for two years in the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, where she worked for an NGO uh, defending uh, people against the violation of human rights. She also worked as a spokesperson for Oxfam. One word about the GUE NGL, the European uh, United Left, Nordic Green uh, Left. As I said, it's the left wing political group in the European Parliament was founded in 1995 and currently consists of 40 members from 18 left-wing socialist, ecologist and communist parties of 13 uh, European uh, countries. Mano, it's very nice having uh, you here. Uh, we will uh, divide uh, this uh, conversation in two parts. After the first part in which Mano will be interviewed by Danai and me, there will be a second part in which the audience is invited uh, to ask uh, questions. How this will proceed will be uh, later explained. And now with any further ado, I pass the floor uh, to my friend Danai. I think she's on mute. I have to open my microphone. Uh, thank you, Walter. Uh, welcome, Manon, to our webinar series. Welcome, everyone. Uh, let me begin without any delay with the first question, but uh, I have to warn you, it's not an easy one. Since the European elections last May, in which the left did not perform well, uh, you, Manon, are chairing, as Walter said, together with Martin Schirdevan, from the German party Die Linke, the GUE-NGL group. It is no secret that the left in Europe sails in heavy waters currently and that the GUE-NGL is not an easy group to lead. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask you, how did you experience this first year in your position? And uh, could you provide us with some insights about the composition of the group and its working methods? Well, there are several questions in, in there. Um, first about the results of the election. Um, of course, this was not as, as good as we could have expected, but uh, it's no secret either that uh, the European elections are always difficult for the left because we come from a, a, a critical uh, perspective on the European Union, which I think is obviously necessary, but we are asking people who are critical about the European Union to send us there. and. We know in all of our countries, uh, abstention is quite high in particular for the European elections and in particular in our political families. And we know for each European elections, that's where our own family goes the, the least um, to vote. So that's a fact. And the second fact, I think, and the second challenge for us is um, to, to be able to, to show that actually it is useful to, to be there and there's a way in between the liberal, you know, naive vision of the European Union 
um, whether it comes from the right wing, from the socialists or from the liberals on one hand, and on the other hand, the very eurosceptic uh, uh, coming from the far right. And I think there's a way in between, and that's what we're trying to do. It's for an alternative of the uh, Europe. Um, you know, we're now just uh, today, actually, 15 years from um, the vote in France on the European constitution, the vote, the result was a no uh, by 55%. That was actually my very first political uh, engagement. Uh, and um, that's how I discovered politics. And a lot of us, especially from my generation, you know, we learned the European Union in the history books. And then the, the, the rare occasions where we, we, we have the opportunity to give our opinion, which was the case in 2005, well, actually our opinion is not respected because two years later, the Lisbon Treaty entered into four, uh, was signed and the Lisbon Treaty is almost a copy paste of the European Constitution on which we actually said no. And we said no, not because we don't want the European Union. It's just we don't want the European Union based on austerity, free trade agreements, uh, competitiveness. This, this, those are just a dogma on which the European Union is built. So that was the first introduction. And then about our group. Um, well, it's, it's obviously a challenge uh, for a, a group because it's very diverse. You know, we're a bit smaller than the Greens, but we're coming from more countries, for example. So in a way, we're more representative. And of course, we have to make live together people from Sweden, Italy, uh, no, Italy not anymore, but Sweden, um, uh, Portugal, Spain, Germany, Greece, Czech Republic. And we have people coming from all of these different countries. That being said, I believe our group became stronger, became stronger because we have a, a stronger political voice for the first time in, in the history of a, of a group. And that's the very first thing I did when I arrived in the group is to actually say, you know, work on 10 key priorities and 10 key expectations from the European Commission. And that's the very first thing we did. Those are the 10 key points that we expect from the commission. We were the only group to actually write on paper. Those are the political expectations on, that we have. And those are the reasons why we voted against Ursula von der Leyen, but there's a political ground on it. And then we worked on, on, on moving forward, making proposal, making counter proposal, because we're not just an opposition in the European Parliament. We constructive opposition. So we make proposals. So when we got to discuss the Green New Deal, well, actually, we made a counter proposal on the Green New Deal. Now, with the Corona uh, virus crisis, um, we also worked on um, a way out of the crisis. Uh, a paper that is called "Solidarity is the Cure" that we just published uh, now about two weeks ago, which uh, tries to uh, uh, propose ways forward uh, and and make proposals to 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 build the future within the European Union post Corona. Uh, a crisis virus on which I think the corona crisis is obviously not only a health crisis it's also it became a social crisis and and an economic crisis and on those three crises and which can also become a democratic crisis so on all those four crises we make proposals and I think this is a kind of a groundbreaking change for a group obviously we we also trying to maintain the um, you know confederate character of the group meaning we can have different views and we live with it. It's actually fuels um, the diversity and, and makes our group very rich. And last but not least, uh, to end my very long answer to that question, I'll make sure to answer then, um, is there was, uh, obviously it's a poll, but there was a poll made a couple of weeks ago on how would groups perform at the European level if they were to be new elections now. And actually a group would increase, I think if I remember com correctly, it was by seven seats. Meaning that I think that we are in a positive dynamic. Like we've seen our friends in Sinn Féin, uh, in Ireland, for example, they did a very, very good result in national elections. So I, I do think that we can um, actually, by showing that we are the answer. We are the answer not just because we say we are right, just because we're providing an alternative that is dealing with the, the crisis uh, that we have uh, at the moment. So hopefully this uh, will uh, have some positive results in the upcoming elections. Thank you very much, Mano, for providing us with this uh, short account on how this very complicated uh, group actually uh, performs under the new, new conditions. 
uh, you rightly mentioned that through the corona crisis, uh, things are now about uh, to change. And uh, I would like to ask you a tricky question, namely, uh, it's obvious that there is a connex between the corona crisis and the ecological crisis. Nevertheless, one has the impression that during the last two months, uh, the issue of the ecological crisis somehow uh, disappeared from the uh, public agenda, or at least the attention of the public uh, diminished uh, towards uh, this crisis. Uh, my question now is, how does you personally see this uh, intersection uh, between uh, the two crises? And how does uh, GUE NGN try uh, to approach the issue that we obviously have to tackle different dimensions of uh, a big and uh, very complicated, dangerous process of human civilization? Well, there are many connections. First off, um, obviously, the uh, corona crisis doesn't come from nowhere. It comes, it's a virus that comes and that is an indirect uh, uh, impact of deforestation. Um, and I also see the, the, the crisis that we are living at the moment as a sort of a general repetition of the climate crisis that we will live in in, in the next years and in the next decade. And, you know, the worst answer would be moving on from the corona crisis to actually to repeat the exact same mistakes that have been done so far. What did we, some of people, some people realized during the crisis that, well, we, we and the European Union has been losing uh, industrial sovereignty, for example, and as a result, we were not even able to produce enough masks during the crisis. And the mask is a piece of paper. And it, we, the European Union, one of the, the, the richest place and region of the world, we're not able to produce piece of paper to protect people uh, from a virus. And this is a direct result of decades of free trade agreements and free trade religion within the European Union. The same goes for medicine. 80% of um, what you need for medicines actually comes from uh, the outside of the European Union. So the worst, again, would be, okay, we realized how weak we were. We realized that uh, such a health crisis actually comes from a, a, um, a ecological change, I would say. And let's you know stay blind and and not look at it and and repeat the same mistake so uh the the world that we need to put together now needs to be radically different and it needs to be ecological and we've seen there's a huge risk and you're right in pointing it out there's a huge risk that um uh you know given the context some are saying well you know let's not care anymore about um, um, uh, green issues and, and let's not care anymore about the planet because we have more urgent issues to deal with. Actually, well, it's, if you, we don't deal with uh, uh, ecological issues, then the impact might be even worse. So in practice, it means a lot of things. Uh, it means first that we have to stop the lobbies that have been very active over the last um, couple of months in trying to water down, to delay any sort of ambition from the European Commission on um, uh, ecological issues. Second is that all of the money that, and I'm sure we'll discuss it later on, but all of the money that is injected in the economy, um, especially as part of the recovery plan, needs to be green. So they need to be green counterparts. We need to have companies that do receive money, but actually their activities, their economy has to be in line with the Paris Agreement. Uh, and we have to uh, support companies to make the transition. Of course, you know, if you think about uh, the aviation sector, if you think about uh, the car sector, of course, from one day to another, you want you know, shut them down and, and cut a lot of jobs, etc. But it's about supporting them in making the transition. And now it's the time more than ever. Thank you.
Thank you, Mano. Uh, just to inform our audience that uh, Mano did a very interesting job on how uh, lobbies uh, function within the EU that you can find on uh, the website of QNGL. So uh, let me come to my next question. Uh, you mentioned before uh, that QNGL was the only group to put forward specific political expectation from the Commission. Now, given the fact that in the in most of the European countries, the first acute phase of the pandemic seems to be over. Uh, this also seems to be the time to evaluate what happened. So uh, how do you think the European institutions, uh, namely the Commission, the Council and the Parliament uh, perform? Did they stay the test and what lessons must we draw from the sanitary crisis? <coughs> Well, um, the short answer is clearly <laughs> uh, they perform quite badly because I think if there's one image to keep in mind um, after um, those two or three months of crisis is European countries, EU countries um, stealing um, personal protection item at one another. So the image that I keep in mind is um, Czech Republic stealing mask at Italy. Italy um, stealing, a, I don't know how you say uh, in French is respirateur, like to breath, uh, at, at Greece. France stealing mask uh, at uh, Italy and Spain. So this is the image of the European Union at the core of the crisis. Instead of organizing the solidarity, organizing the production, including the requisition of uh, uh, production sites, whatever companies, to produce whatever we were needed. That's what the state is made uh, for. And the European Union should be the body to actually coordinate the needs. Obviously, we were not facing um, the pandemic in, 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 in the same way. And how come we've been, you know, leaving aside, and, and here I'm really waiting the words, we've been leaving aside our colleagues our friends in Italy, in Spain, but even in some part of France, because the European Union was just not able to organize the solidarity. And on top of this, as you know, they were realizing how weak they were in terms of um, uh, industry, for example, as a result, as I was saying earlier, free trade agreements, etc. And you know, they would they would make very nice speeches about, oh, we need. Uh, to uh, relocalize our production and to move back our production and our industry back to you, the European Union, etc. That's about the discourse. But at the very same time, they were signing new free trade agreements, like the one with Mexico. And we were like in the middle of the crisis. The minimum would have been, well, we suspend the negotiation. We question our model. Of course, we've been the ones on our side, like fighting those free trade agreements and we think they should not be signed. But at least from their perspective, they should have been saying, well, actually, we pause for a moment. But those people are just liars. And those people are just the ones that are killing the European dream in a way, killing the European project. And, you know, although now they're trying to, you know, come out with, with plans to actually um, uh, at least show that there is an attempt of solidarity, and we will talk then of, uh, uh, about the recovery plan. But in the midst of the crisis, the European Union completely failed, completely failed. And I think that's something we'll remember for a long period of time. One indicator of this is just ask Italians what do they think about the European Union. The Italians exit, I don't know how you call it, but people wanted to leave the European Union in Italy has not been as high as, as, as now. And well, the European Union will have to question itself for, for that result. It's clearly because they've been failing in, in helping and supporting. And if the European Union doesn't exist to implement solidarity, well, then I don't know what it exists for. Yes, this, this criticism uh, towards the European Union, uh, this is a, a very general phenomenon uh, throughout uh, Europe. However, 
one has the impression uh, that uh, now the EU uh, tries to catch up in a certain way. And last week, the European Commission came up uh, with uh, its own recovery package labeled uh, Next Generation EU. Uh, that is, of course, uh, linked uh, with the discussion on the midterm financial framework, which means the budget of the European Union for uh, the years uh, to come. For an ordinary citizens, citizen, the uh, numbers, the amounts of money uh, seem quite impressive. Uh, nevertheless, they fall short even uh, in comparison to uh, the demands which the European Parliament uh, recently uh, had put forward. Your comment um, on the issue of uh, the uh, recovery program uh, of the European Commission were uh, quite uh, sober, Mano. So uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what's your general interpretation of this package program and uh, what would be the alternatives uh, you would put forward uh, in confrontation with it? I was a mute. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of things to say about the package. Um, first, uh, a comment on, on the number. Yes, it seems impressive, but they're putting together numbers that have nothing to do. They're putting together, you know, um, adding together, sorry, um, uh, money that is not fresh money, but those are just guarantee for loans, for example, like as, as part of the very first package that was uh, um, uh, presented by the European Commission at the, at the beginning of the crisis. Um, they're, they're adding um, the uh, multi-annual uh, financial framework, which is not new money that needed to be negotiated anyway. So it's, it's confusing. And, and this is on purpose because they want to give us the impression that, look, they've been giving so much money that why are you complaining? Well, first, it's actually very, very, very far from what we've been asking, like the recovery plan, the European Parliament, and that's a resolution we've um, uh, been partly supporting, uh, is we've, we've actually asked for uh, two trillion. Um, and we got, in terms of new money, again, it's only 700, uh, 750 uh, billions. So that makes a big difference. It's like a, a bit more than a third of what we were originally asking. So there's an issue about the amounts of money. Then there's an issue about uh, democracy. It's like, okay, well, there's new money, but then this money, um, the way it's going to be distributed, um, who is going to decide? How, which criteria are they going to use? To what extent they're going to they're um, back, back this up um, with a democratic consent, at least with the European Parliament? We, we are not sure of this. And last but not least, uh, uh, there are two the most problematic uh, issues uh, to me. One is that um, they are giving money uh, to regions, but states to receive this money, they have to respect the uh, European uh, uh, traje trajectory. I don't remember the, the English word. In other words, they have to respect a certain number of uh, economic conditions. In other words, they have to implement austerity measures. Of course, one may argue that, well, the European semester, which is a system to uh, uh, control uh, uh, states' budgets, might evolve as a result of the crisis. And of course, we would keep pushing for it. But still, you know, what is the austerity? What is the um, European? What has the European semester done so far? Well, as part of the European semester, the European Commission recommended 63 times between 2008 and 2013, 63 times to member states to cut in the health budget. We know the results. We know the results. It's beds that have been cut all across the European Union. And this is a common pattern. Those beds that we were missing in the midst of the crisis is the result of the European Commission recommendations to cut in um, the public services. So thinking that we will build a solution and find a solution with the same rules, the same mistakes is a completely complete lie. And last issue, there's a confusion also about 
loan versus grants. But actually, um, it's true that the European Union um, and the Commission is proposing new own resources. And personally, and by the way, this is not consensual within the, the GUI group, but my personal view on this is that it's a good news. Uh, if, you know, with the crisis, they speed up the implementation of a plastic tax, of a carbon tax at the border of the European Union, it's good from an ecological perspective, and it's good as well, because it builds on some own resources that would not ask states to further contribute to the European Union. But despite this, this new own resources, the rest, well, the rest states will have to pay it back. So it's debt that is added to debt. And of course, debt for me is not an issue. We're not the right wing people saying, you know, oh, we shouldn't indebt ourselves, blah, 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 blah. But the problem with the debt is that precisely is it is used as an argument by the right wing and by the um, the um, liberals to actually ask for some you know a sacrifice from the people to ask them to um, to you know reduce their pension work more we we know all of this and if you look at the business associations they've already started this this you know this music that we know very well we know too well and i think that the commission missed the historic opportunity to actually you know uh, um, uh, take a turning point uh, in in the european economy by for example cancelling part of the european debt we we don't our people usually don't know uh, that actually um, the part of the debt is owned by the European Central Bank, despite um, the treaties forbidding the European Central Bank to uh, 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 loan uh, money directly to states. And of course, this, this treaty article should be changed and we shouldn't be the only part of the world where we, can, we cannot use the monetary policy because monetary policy, well, there's the word policy in it and we should actually use it for the general interest. But still, the ECB has been uh, buying back from banks part of uh, the, their debt. For example, in France, the ECB owns about 20% of the French debt. So if we were to cancel this, which is completely doable, we're not talking about debt that is owned by banks or by private people. We're talking about debt owned by the ECB. Well, then you would give a very you know, new fresh air to states without any, you know, conditionalities and without any austerity counterpart. And that's to finish the answer to my question. That's precisely what our group is proposing and will keep proposing because I think at this point, this is the only serious way forward. Thank you, Mano. You already answered part of the question I was going to ask. However, I will give you the, the opportunity to elaborate a bit more. You mentioned earlier uh, several times the, how Europe failed to coordinate the necessary solidarity uh, during the pandemic. Uh, this is precisely the title of uh, the paper that Gwen Giel published two weeks prior to the uh, Commission's proposal. Uh, that is Solidarity is the Cure, Reimagining a Post-Pandemic Europe. So um, Gwen Triel presents this uh, proposal as a progressive vision for a radical different Europe. Uh, could you please give us some more details on its content and maybe contrast it to the other proposals on the table, for example, the Merkel-Macron Fund and uh, the Commission's proposal? Yeah, as you said, I started to, to answer this question. I think to build on what I've been saying, one of the um, tools um, is clearly to, to use the ECB, to use it for what it uh, should be done actually, which is uh, to, to, do, to do proper politics. And in the very short run, uh, so the, the debt that the ECB owns should be canceled. And then it should be um, uh, possible that the ECB directly uh, loan money to states 
um, in the form of perpetual debt, so long-term debt that in a way states would not have to pay back. So that's from the monetary policy. But it's funny because in the economists thinking about, you know, about the solution that the European level, you usually have the um, money, what, what I would call uh, the monetary people and the fiscalist people and the tax people. And they are saying, oh, we need to use the ECB, blah, 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 blah. And the others say, oh, we need to tax the rich. We need, we need to tax multinationals, etc." But actually, I think those two solutions are very complementary. And that's what we're putting forward in our proposals, which is in, in simple terms, canceled um, the, the debts that um, uh, the ECB owns, which more or less corresponds to the equivalent of uh, how much uh, countries and states injected uh, during uh, the crisis. So very first step. Second step that uh, states are able to borrow money directly from the ECB to make investments. So to make investments for the green transition, for example. So to make uh, uh, investment in the renewable energies, this would create millions of jobs across the European Union. And this is also a solution to the transition of some of the sectors uh, I was talking about earlier, like the aviation sector. And then, um, to, to have a full picture of the economic answer, well, we should use the tax policy uh, and the tax tools as it is. The, the objectives are twofold. One is obviously to uh, fund the state's uh, policies and second to redistribute money. And this is why uh, from a tax perspective, we should be uh, taxing uh, the richest people. Uh, we should be uh, taxing uh, wealth like it used to exist in France, but was uh, uh, um, moved away by Macron, one of the first things he did when he came to power. And um, one thing that also we put forward is to, um, to tax the ones who, which have benefited from the crisis. Think about Amazon, think about uh, some of the insurance companies, think about uh, uh, the supermarkets, so Carrefour, Auchan, all of those big supermarkets that uh, have increased their profits. So, you know, during past um, crisis and during uh, like uh, the First World War in France, for example, they decided on a, on a tax, what they called in France, in tax sur les profiteurs de guerre. So it's a tax on those who took advantage of the war. This should be the same now. And you know, Macron is talking a lot about, oh, we're in war, we're in war. Okay, well, I don't think we're in war, but you, if you think that you're in war, at least use some of the policies that have been introduced during the war to face the challenges that we have at the moment. So that's for the um, economic answers. And of course, this should be done together with the uh, ecological and social answer. Social answer, by um, uh, paying, uh, increase the salaries of all of the low salaries in the health sector, but obviously not, not only the one, you know, working in supermarkets, etc. cetera. Um, it's one thing to upload them at 8 p.m. every evening. It's another uh, to actually uh, pay them what they deserve to be paid. Um, and this all together should come with a green transition plan uh, because we have a historic opportunity to shift a whole economy towards a, gr a greener one. Um, so that's in short what we have in our, um, in our paper and in trying also to, you know, to, just to say there is an alternative. It's not like we're not condemned to suffer from austerity in the next decades. No, there is an alternative. And there is an alternative that is greener, that preserve our planet. And that's what we'll keep fighting for in the coming months and years. Uh, thank you. Yes, indeed, uh, there is an alternative. Uh, however, when uh, the heads of the states convene in the forthcoming uh, European Council meeting, uh, there will be actually uh, the Commission uh, program on the table, uh, then four governments, shamefully, uh, amongst them also my or the government which is supposed to uh, represent Austria 
put forward a strong opposition to any attempt of, of a, a solidaristic uh, solution to uh, the crisis. So it will be uh, not an easy uh, ride through uh, this uh, meeting of the council. Uh, then you have as a third position, uh, the uh, program of the European Parliament. And I wonder, and I want to ask you, what uh, do you expect to happen? And what in your opinion uh, should be the response of the European Parliament in case that the European Council fails uh, to find an appropriate and solidaristic solution to the pandemic crisis, but as well uh, to uh, the most likely uh, coming recession? Um, so first, a word about these four uh, selfish countries, if I can call them. Um, of course, uh, this is a challenge because there's a need for the unanimity in the Council. So if they do not agree with the very already weak package of the Commission, then it will <coughs> become um, harder to uh, find a, a, a deal. And most likely, in a way or another, it's going to be watered down afterwards. But it's 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 so yeah it's so um ironic in a way uh, that you know those countries are giving lessons but in those countries you have a country like netherlands for example that is a european union tax seven and that kept stealing money stealing tax bases out of the other european countries and that has been doing everything but solidarity, and now says, you know, you know, every state should find their own solution. Come on, guys, you've been stealing us money for decades. Now it's your turn to help the others. So that's why I'm still pissed at, at those countries, like how can they be so selfish in a way? Um, so that's about the, the four countries. Now, um, uh, there will need to be an agreement in the council uh, together with the Commission, and I'm not going to lie to you, the role and the power of the European Parliament in that process is way too weak, way too weak. Um, one sign of this, by the way, is that uh, David Sassoli, the President of the European Parliament, has been out of the very first discussion on the recovery plan. It's just because, why bother about democracy? You know, they just can decide that between themselves and between closed doors because there's no transparency about how decisions are taken in the council. That's just how it works. And now, you know, one might answer and argue, well, then why do you bother sitting in the European Parliament if you do nothing? Well, because I believe we're whistleblowers. I believe we're the ones, you know, uh, we, we're the ones saying this should not be happening this way. We're the ones saying there, are, there is an alternative. We are the ones, you know, this, maybe this, this very small rock in, in, your, in your shoe, but we're still there. And that rock can make actually other small rocks in, in, in the shoes and at the end uh, make, make things move. The last remark on the recovery plan that I didn't make uh, earlier is that, um, you know, you mentioned that the name of the recovery plan is Next Generation EU. And I find it quite ironic as well that they uh, dare blame, uh, they dare calling it next generation EU when actually they're going to ask the next generation to pay back this money. And at the end of the day, it's the next generation paying the impact of their mistakes. And I say their mistakes because I don't feel part of those generation. You know, I'm born after the fall of the Berlin Wall. I've learned the European Union in the history books. And what I've learned in the history books, you know, words about solidarity, etc. that's not what I'm living at the moment. So when they, they think about the next generation, and if they want the next generation to believe in the EU project, well, then they have to change it you know, right now, and they have to change it radically. And that's, again, what we will keep fighting for. 
So, Manon, you described the EU using uh, very dark colors. So, I would like to uh, see if we can possibly discuss about the positive scenario. Uh, as you already mentioned, there is now a widespread new appreciation of the work of health healthcare uh, workers and uh, of the employees in the welfare systems, which are by majority women also. Uh, they are rightly regarded as the heroes of the moment. Many people seem to recognize the importance of uh, sufficiently funded public services. And uh, of course, as you said, applauding people working in the health, uh, health sector is not enough. But the question is, can we expect that in the wake of the pandemic, the tides will turn against austerity and neoliberalism? Or is it just a, a short parenthesis? It's up to us to make a history. So it's up to us to go down in the street as soon as it's possible, try to reclaim those rights. Because be sure, those rights will not come from gr for granted. They will not come if you don't ask for them. So obviously this will be part of the challenge in the coming months and years is like all of those that, will, that we applauded now, they need to be ones uh, um, with with what they deserve, and um, and they they need proper um, uh, proper salaries, for example. And there are many ways to go around it. You know, I've been uh, uh, very actively advocating for an increase of salaries for um, uh, I would say women-dominated jobs. Um, you know, those jobs uh, like nurse like uh, the ones working in supermarkets, et cetera. There are mostly women between 80 to 90%, and they're very badly paid. And uh, nevertheless, they are essential in our society. Probably, to be honest, much more central than a, a lot of the bullshit jobs, that including a lot of my friends have, and probably um, I might do one of those jobs one day. But those people are, are much more useful to our society. So I've been campaigning hard on on um, an increase of salaries for them, and the avenues for it. There's avenue first uh, through the role of the state, because the state directly employs a lot of them: nurses in public hospitals, for example, teachers, etc. So the states can decide um, to increase their salaries. That's one way. A second way to go uh, around it is uh, to include those requests as part of, you know, counterparts that the state is asking when giving money, public aid to uh, companies. Well, we support you in this very difficult moment, but you increase the lower salary, you ban dividends, you redistribute uh, in a way wealth within companies. So that's, those are avenues um, and to come back to your question, like whether being optimist or pessimistic, I'm an eternal, I, I'm a forever uh, optimistic. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be an activist. So probably the, the day I become too pessimistic, I, I'll just stop and do something else, which I think, by the way, is, is, is nice as well, because someone doing politics for all of his or, or her life is probably not good. So hopefully you won't see me sitting in a European Parliament in, in, in 50 years and, and being very sarcastic about the way it, 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 things are happening in the Parliament. Um, I'll be this, this activist uh, um, doing happening in, in the European Parliament if needed, uh, uh, fighting for this for a couple of years and then, and then probably do something else. Um, but leading this fight with optimism and with conviction that this is the only way to go. And I believe there is a very wide support for those fairer policies. Now it's up to us, it's up to the left across the European Union um, to be able to translate those hopes, those wishes into concrete change. That's our challenge now. Thanks for this. Uh, to wind up this uh, first chapter of our conversation, I would like to make a switch. Uh, I would like to ask you, Manon, uh, what role do you see for the left in the post 
uh, pandemic uh, period. And in particular, uh, what kind of uh, alliances, corporations uh, on the transnational level uh, the uh, GUE NGL is aspiring? Well, um, I think, as I said, our role is central uh, because our, our responsibility now is to be able to translate these hopes into change for people. Now, how do we do it? Well, I think, um, of course, we won't do it ourselves. We won't just do it like this. We won't do it, and as much as I like uh, uh, Zoom conversations, etc., we won't do it this way either, or only this way. We'll do it only if we're able to build on social movement. If we, we will do it only if there's a, a critical mass um, um, uh, taking actions. And, um, you know, I think we are the only group in the European Parliament building those relationships to ties, very strong ties with social movement, being uh, trade unions, being NGOs, being associations. Um, and, and being activists in the very different forms that they exist. And this should be strengthened more than ever to build on their campaign, to actually to be a voice of their campaign in the European Parliament. You know, I say very often that the very first day I arrived in the Parliament, it's actually exactly a year ago, when I arrived, I realized how this house is disconnected from reality. It's disconnected from reality because you have the same people for such a, such a long time. You have people living in their bubbles. You have people being well too paid. You know, they're just like not real people. Like not, not like uh, any, anyone you might see in the streets. And those people, they live in their bubbles. And I think our responsibility as the left is to, to destroy those very thick walls that exist between the European institution and the reality. And we do this by ourselves being very involved, ourselves as uh, members of the European Parliament being very involved in social movement, by taking some of the social movement to the European Parliament, by also taking on the, on the initiative. For example, I, I launched uh, also an initiative uh, that they called the uh, Milborn dans une Europe en Berne. I said it in French because it doesn't work well in English, but it's a, an initiative in, on bike. So my objective is to do a thousand of kilometers uh, by bike. Uh, I started in France, but probably I will cover other countries in, in the next couple of years. And my point is to go talk to people. So I've been talking to farmers, to NGO associations at the border fighting for migrant rights. I've been uh, talking to um, uh, scientific uh, uh, specialized uh, on, on uh, ecology. I've been meeting a lot of different people. Um, but you know, when you arrive somewhere and I'm, I'm just like <laughs> uh, uh, wearing my, my bike uh, stuff with me and, uh, and, and you show that you're willing to discuss not just because you were in an electoral period and you want something out of them, just, just because you were sincere in the way you want to uh, precisely uh, uh, make closer the real life and the European institution. So I think we need, I'm not saying this initiative is like, uh, should be done by everyone and will solve everything, of course not. But we need all of those initiatives for the left to actually um, um, become um, even more credible and to um, make the connection between uh, what's taking place in the political world and what's taking place in the real world. Thank you, Mana, for the aspiring ideas. Now, uh, let us wrap up the first part of the discussion. And we are now proceeding to the questions and answers part. Uh, please refer to the Q&A box at the bottom of your controls. I can see that you already sent some uh, questions. Uh, we have Roland Kulke, who is representing our network in Brussels, who will collect your questions and then read them, read them out. Uh, we have to terminate the session by 7.15 p.m. Central European time, so please forgive us in case we are not able to present all your questions. 
However, you have also the possibility to like questions of others in the Q&A box. And you can use, of course, the chat only to introduce yourself, comment on the discussion and share links or ask technical questions. Roland, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, hello, uh, Mano. Also, a warm welcome from my side. Uh, I'm in the rather comfortable uh, position uh, to be able uh, to select from uh, rather some questions. Uh, I would like to start with uh, two, let's say, more policy-oriented questions uh, to you. Um, one uh, of the participants asked a very concrete question relating to Hungary. He says money is being sent from uh, European level to Hungary, but all the money ends up in the hands of Orban and his networks. And what could be done, what could the GUA NGL do uh, to really uh, channel the money directly to the people, uh, civil society organizations, uh, the free press and small and medium enterprises? Is, is there anything to do? Uh, well, I, if you don't I mind, think, I just... Uh, oh, okay, sure, 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 sure. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, and I would add just for you a second question. Uh, the question is, what role can nuclear power play in decarbonizing the whole energy sector? Well, two very different uh, 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 questions. First, on Hungary, well, there's already money that is uh, channeled to civil society organization, to um, uh, the ones uh, we're doing things um, in, in, in Hungary, obviously. Um, the, the, the main uh, funds, uh, they're uh, going to the states as the way it works in the European Union, also for uh, sovereignty uh, reasons. But there are things we can do. There are things we can do because uh, the rule of law is part of the um, uh, good thing, I would say, in the European uh, Union, in the core values, but also in the treaties. It's uh, protected by uh, Article 7 of the treaties, and then um, <laughs> there are put, uh, possible sanctions. Now, the, difficult, um, the difficulties we've had so far and the challenges is that actually, um, it's very hard to have a, a majority in the parliament, uh, but also uh, the council and the commission are obviously very weak on the matter to actually implement those, things, those sanctions. But from a theoretical perspective, there's a lot of things we could do. Um, we could also think, uh, during the uh, coronavirus crisis, uh, there has been an emergency uh, law voted in in, the, in Hungary that uh, gives full power, if I can say, to uh, Orban. And I think the reaction of the European Union institution has been very, very, very weak and way too weak. Uh, and we should have said, well, um, you know, it's uh, uh, democracy should not be locked down uh, during the, the crisis. Unfortunately, it's been I would say once more uh, in Hungary, and that's why Article 7 should be strictly respective in that perspective. Then for um, the second question um, on uh, uh, nuclear, uh, to be honest, that's part of the things we disagree in our group, and that's part of the things we uh, have debates on. I'm a strong advocate against uh, nuclear. Obviously, I'm not saying we should go from one day to another uh, um, and, and close all of the nuclear power plants, but they cost a huge amount of money, and obviously they are very, very risky. And are we going to wait, you know, for another catastrophe somewhere in the European Union before we actually plan our way out of uh, nuclear energy? And there's a tendency in the European Union to think that nuclear energy is clean, which is not true. Uh, think about um, everything that's been produced. I don't know in English the word in French, we say déchet. So it's everything that's been produced that well, then you need to do, sorry? The waste. The, the waste. waste, yeah, sorry. So yeah, English not being my mother tongue, sometimes I am I'm, uh, looking for the word. So yeah, you need, uh, you need to, to, to deal with the waste and um, and obviously decades after decades, it's more and more waste. And we know this is waste that cannot be, um, that, that cannot be uh, recycled in a way. And it's a time to um, uh, make real 
read planification and planification is not about word it's just about planning a future and planning a future is planning an um, objective of 100 percent renewable energies and we should be able to do this by 2050 but for that we need investment and for investment we need money and then we come back to what i was saying earlier about where does this money should come from uh, the role that the European Central Board should be playing, et cetera, et cetera. But the real Green New Deal should actually be about this. And um, uh, we call it Marshall Plan whatsoever. I, I don't care, but it's a big investment plan for uh, um, the green transition. And when it comes to energy, well, we can, we can actually, uh, it can work 100% renewable energies. And again, this would create millions of jobs in the European Union. So it's safer, it creates jobs, and it's greener. That's the way we should be taking, I believe. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. I um, uh, just take, because uh, it fits so well in what you just said, the last question just, uh, which has arrived. Uh, the question is, do you think that there's room for a red-red-green collaboration in the European Parliament to push for an important change in EU policy and politics away from austerity and towards a more solidaristic social and democratic Europe? Well, you might uh, know that uh, the, the name of one of our members of our group is actually called Red Green Alliance, our colleagues in Denmark. So I do believe, I do believe, I think our group uh, here in the parliament, our great group has never been so strong on uh, ecological issue and on environmental issues um, because we have a new generation of uh, MEPs, because we have movements that have been uh, built really on green issues like recent uh, movements like Bloco in Portugal, like uh, Podemos in Spain, La France Insoumise in France, etc. And we're part of this of this generation who is actually going to suffer directly from climate change. You know, I'm just 40 years old and I will see the results of climate change in my life. And and I don't want to even imagine this for my potential kids, like for the next generation to come. So, um, so this is an incentive to actually um, uh, find an, an avenue for a red-green alliance because it's urgent, because we have no choice. And I believe that um, a green transition should be social. You know, there was this uh, slogan in, in France during the Gilets Jaunes movement uh, that says, um, end of the month, end of the world, same fight. And it is the same fight because the ones who are polluting the most are the richest. They are large companies. So if we redistribute wealth, we actually preserve our planet. And from a more political perspective, um, uh, and thinking very concretely speaking about, for example, the green um, uh, group. Obviously, we're working a lot with them. Um, we have some disagreements, but they're also very diverse. Whether you talk to, you know, uh, uh, the French greens or the, the German greens, uh, it also depends uh, who you talk to in the French greens, obviously. But you know, they are more or less liberal on an economic uh, um, uh, perspective. So there are, there are um, potentialities, there are avenues for us to collaborate to actually build an alternative. And probably now more than ever in the European Parliament that the Parliament has never been so divided, um, that there's no group that has the majority not even EPP, so the right wing and the socialists have the majority together like it used to be in the previous mandate. Obviously, they do have the majority together with the liberals, but it, it does create funny things because sometimes we also can make a, um, a progressive alliance on the left to try to push for some of the uh, green elements in particular, although obviously uh, uh, this, this is not an easy task and there will remain disagreements with the other groups. Um, yeah, one more question, which is really connected to what you said, is uh, one of the first questions uh, we received was, um, 
uh, from obviously a younger participant. Um, uh, the question is, uh, the younger generation is suffering uh, directly by uh, the recession uh, uh, from uh, COVID-19 and also from the climate crisis. And how can we help the younger generation make sure that this gener younger generation is not one of the biggest victims of the pandemic? As I said earlier, I think they are definitely the biggest victim. And that's why I said that it was very ironic that the recovery plan is called next generation because they're precisely the ones who are gonna pay the price for it. How do we help them? Well, by campaigning with them by sitting together, you know, in the youth for climate movement, in extension rebellion, in whatever movement they're in, by, you know, being on their side to actually uh, campaign. And the new generation, what is very interesting is that a lot of them, they politicize themselves through um, uh, ecological and environmental issues. And they actually have a quite radical uh, perspective on which I think we should build. We should also sometimes question ourselves. We should include their perspective. And sorry to be a bit provocative there, but sometimes in the left, there is this, you know, long, long standing uh, tradition of, uh, 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 let's say some of the left movement not being very green, um, not being very activist, you know, I've been an activist myself in the parliament. I've been, I've been uh, inviting extension rebellion to the parliament. Well, I've said in the video that they would invite them and I've been sanctioned by the parliament for this. I've been doing happening in the, in, 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 in the hemicycle as well, you know, um, to try to uh, carry their voice. And I know I am sometimes criticized for this but I believe that's the sense of the history. That it's not because we're sitting in the European Parliament that you know we should wear those nice suits and and speak like this and uh, being a man because mostly they, those are men. And yes, no, I'm I'm part of this young generation that is activist, and we need to be on the side of those people because they're politicizing themselves like this, you know. To be clear, 50 years ago, that it was maybe in, in, in you would politicize yourself in the, in the young uh, Communist Party. 20 years ago, you might politicize yourself in the social movements uh, on, on social issues. Well, this generation, they're politicizing themselves a lot on ecological issue. And we, we, the left, we should not miss this opportunity to have like a, a generation standing on the side with us and trying to achieve that change. Because there's no planet B. There's no planet B. And if we don't manage to, um, you know, uh, make this turn, well, then all of us will be screwed. Uh, and in particular, the younger generation. So that's also what I'm trying to impulse uh, within the left uh, at the European level is to think out of the box when it comes to proposals. So I've been working a lot on the Green New Deal to make uh, social and ecological proposals to be technical, to be precise on the one hand, but on the other hand, also being an activist. And that's why, that's I think what we should be um, as member of the European Parliament sitting in uh, the, the GUE NGL group. Thanks a lot, uh, Mano. Uh, I feel terribly sorry, but um, I uh, have to terminate part of the conversation. I'm really sorry uh, to open for questions, um, but I give the floor back to Walter. Yes, for me now only remains uh, to conclude. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation, I think very inspiring and I thank you Mano very much for your patience uh, and your availability to ask it to respond to our questions and particularly to the questions of the uh, of the audience thanks for this very much I also have to thank uh, Danai uh, Kolchida from the Nikos Polanzas Institute I find it always fascinating having this kind of events in which people in Paris in Brussels in Vienna and Athens collaborate in a discussion and, and, and are able to communicate. 
I want to thank uh, Roland for collecting uh, and selecting the questions. Uh, to Angelina Janopoulou, who unfortunately uh, never appears on the screen. However, she is the general manager of the whole series. And let me add one thing. Um, neither uh, Roland nor Angelina are professional moderators. They are actually the scientific co uh, collaborators in Transform. Angelina working in the field of research on strategies of the left. Uh, Roland working uh, in the field of Green New Deal and productive transformation. So what they are doing is helping uh, to have these events happening. And the last word is uh, that we are looking forward uh, next week to have again a fascinating female leader of the left, uh, Clementine Autain, uh, who is from uh, Asaba. She is a member in the National Assembly of France, voted on the ticket of France SMEs. Uh, that event will take place at 6 o'clock uh, p.m. And hopefully we see each other again on this occasion. Thank you very much to all of you. Walter, if I just uh, might add a, a few words, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, please, um, please. Um, just because I've seen uh, one question in, in the chat on this, uh, asking, uh, uh, you know, why wouldn't, wouldn't you make an alliance with uh, uh, the NGO uh, Greenpeace and trade unions because there's an attempt in France of uh, uh, putting together, you know, uh, organization from a different culture. And I would just wanted to precise this. Um, uh, and not only we, we, we can, but we are actually very active. Uh, and I think that's the type of way forward for the left is to manage to bring together organization and social movement from a different culture, but fighting together for a different world. So organization like Greenpeace, uh, trade union like CGT, social movement like attack and those together that's with them that actually we can build that alternative that is coming from the ground and this type of model is very interesting at French level but it would be interesting to reproduce it in different uh, EU countries and I think um, this when I you know it's it brings me hope. Um, it's also uh, uh, the world I'm coming from, because as you mentioned, I've been working for Oxfam and different NGOs, but I believe we actually should keep trying to make the connections between those different worlds. And I would add um, think tank, uh, like uh, Transform and, and all of the great economists and, and um, academia who help us actually uh, uh, being innovative in the way we think our societies. So that's also to finish on a, a bit of hope uh, for, for our, you know, political movements uh, uh, as, a, as a whole uh, in France, but also across the European Union. And thanks very much for the invitation. Hopefully it was um, useful for everyone and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, uh, further collaboration. Thank you very much, Manu. There can't be better concluding words for this event. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>